Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the December 2023 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of the 1957 Moscow Declaration, formerly known as the Declaration of the Communist and Workers' Parties of the Socialist Countries, meeting in Moscow, USSR, 1957. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon or buy me a coffee at patreon.com slash socialismforall or buymeacoffee.com slash socialismforall. There are links to Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee in the video description. So before we begin, what is this piece? Well, the most recently uploaded audiobook that we did was a speech by Enver Hoxha, the first secretary of the Central Committee of the Party of Labor of Albania, titled Reject the Revisionist Theses of the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Anti-Marxist Stand of Khrushchev's Group, Uphold Marxism-Leninism. And this piece, the 1957 Moscow Declaration, is a tie-in with that, as is the next audiobook that we'll be uploading, which is the 1960 Statement of 81 Communist and Workers' Parties, basically similar to the Moscow Declaration, but updated by three years. So this was a contentious time in the international communist movement, several years following the death of Stalin, and even later after the disbanding of the Communist International, or Comintern, and the Communist Information Bureau, or Common Form, and these international meetings were an attempt to do something similar, although not identical. The actual outcome, however, was a major rift forming between the USSR under Khrushchev's leadership, Khrushchev having done the secret speech, denouncing Stalin, and all kinds of other things that did not go over so well with all Marxist-Leninists, a rift between this new phase of the USSR and China, and of course, Hoxha of Albania sided with China in that, so one of the fruits of these international conferences is this declaration in 1957, and then another one in 1960 about the state of the international communist movement. So again, behind the scenes, there were major problems developing between Maoist China and Khrushchev's USSR over issues like, is the USSR going revisionist? All the talk of peaceful coexistence, which had been discussed by Stalin, at least as far as, of course, the socialist countries do not want war with the imperialist countries, but the understanding that that violence would be brought sooner or later by the imperialists was now turning suspiciously into more of a reformist seeming type of discourse, more rapprochement toward the social democratic parties and reformists. So while the 1957 meeting was an attempt, at least in part, by the USSR to rearticulate the trajectory of international communism, there were now other major players in the game, and they didn't seem to be agreeing. Again, for more details, refer back to the Hoja piece that we just uploaded. And in addition to the two statements that we're uploading now, we're going to be doing another one by Mao from 1964, which continues on these themes titled On Khrushchev's Phony Communism and Its Historical Lessons for the World. Comment on the open letter of the Central Committee of the CPSU. All right, with that said, let's do the front matter and then get into it. The source of this text is the complete text of the Declaration of the Twelve Communist and Workers' Parties, meeting in Moscow, USSR, November 14-16, 1957, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution, published in New York by New Century Publishers, December 1957. HTML transcription and markup by Juan Fajardo, from Marxists.org, April 2010. We also have a publisher's note, which reads, Representatives of 12 Communist and Workers' Parties of Socialist Countries, in Moscow for the celebration of the 40th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution in Russia, met on November 14-16, 1957, and adopted a declaration, the text of which is published in this pamphlet in full as a public service. The text, supplied in English translation by the Xinhua News Agency of Peking, is reprinted from the December 1957 issue of the monthly magazine, Political Affairs. Let's begin. Representatives of the Albanian Party of Labor, the Bulgarian Communist Party, the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party, the Vietnamese Working People's Party, the Socialist Unity Party of Germany, the Communist Party of China, the Korean Party of Labor, the Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party, the Polish United Workers' Party, the Romanian Workers' Party, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia discussed their relations, current problems of the international situation, and the struggle for peace and socialism. The exchange of opinions revealed identity of views of the parties on all the questions examined at the meeting and unanimity in their assessment of the international situation. In the course of the discussion, the meeting also touched upon general problems of the international communist movement. 
In drafting the declaration, the participants in the meeting consulted with representatives of the fraternal parties in the capitalist countries. The fraternal parties not present at this meeting will assess and themselves decide what action they should take on the considerations expressed in the declaration. Section 1. The main content of our epoch is the transition from capitalism to socialism, which was begun by the Great October Socialist Revolution in Russia. Today, more than a third of the population of the world, over 950 million people, have taken the road of socialism and are building a new life. The tremendous growth of the forces of socialism has stimulated the rapid extension of the anti-imperialist national movement in the post-war period. During the last 12 years, besides the Chinese People's Republic, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and the Korean People's Democratic Republic, over 700 million people have shaken off the colonial yoke and established national independent states. The peoples of the colonial and dependent countries, still languishing in slavery, are intensifying the struggle for national liberation. The progress of socialism and of the national liberation movement has greatly accelerated the disintegration of imperialism. With regard to the greater part of mankind, imperialism has lost its one-time domination. In the imperialist countries, society is rent by deep-going class contradictions and by antagonisms between those countries, while the working class is putting up increasing resistance to the policy of imperialism and the monopolies, fighting for better conditions, democratic rights, for peace and socialism. In our epoch, world development is determined by the course and results of the competition between two diametrically opposed social systems. In the past 40 years, socialism has demonstrated that it is a much higher social system than capitalism. It has ensured development of the productive forces at a rate unprecedented and impossible for capitalism, and the raising of the material and cultural levels of the working people. The Soviet Union's strides in economics, science, and technology and the results achieved by the other socialist countries in socialist construction are conclusive evidence of the great vitality of socialism. In the socialist states, the broad masses of the working people enjoy genuine freedom and democratic rights. People's power ensures political unity of the masses, equality and friendship among the nations, and a foreign policy aimed at preserving universal peace and rendering assistance to the oppressed nations in their emancipation struggle. The world socialist system, which is growing and becoming stronger, is exerting ever greater influence upon the international situation, the interests of peace and progress, and the freedom of the peoples. While socialism is on the upgrade, imperialism is headed toward decline. The positions of imperialism have been greatly weakened as a result of the disintegration of the colonial system. The countries that have shaken off the yoke of colonialism are defending their independence and fighting for economic sovereignty, for international peace. The existence of the socialist system and the aid rendered by the socialist nations to these countries on principles of equality and cooperation between them and the socialist nations in the struggle for peace and against aggression help them to uphold their national freedom and facilitate their social progress. In the imperialist countries, the contradictions between the productive forces and production relations have become acute. In many respects, modern science and engineering are not being used in the interests of social progress for all mankind, because capitalism fetters and deforms the development of the productive forces of society. The world capitalist economy remains shaky and unstable. The relatively good economic activity still observed in a number of capitalist countries is due in large measure to the arms drive and other transient factors. However, the capitalist economy is bound to encounter deeper slumps and crises, the temporary high business activity helps to keep up the reformist illusions among part of the workers in the capitalist countries. In the post-war period, some sections of the working class in the more advanced capitalist countries, fighting against increased exploitation and for a higher standard of living, have been able to win certain wage increases, though in a number of these countries, real wages are below the pre-war level. However, in the greater part of the capitalist world, particularly in the colonial and dependent countries, millions of people still live in poverty. The broad invasion of agriculture by the monopolies and the price policy dictated by them, the system of bank credits and loans, and the increased taxation caused by the arms drive have resulted in the steady ruin and impoverishment of the main mass of the peasantry. There is a sharpening of contradiction, not only between the bourgeois and the working class, but also between the monopoly bourgeoisie and all sections of the people, between the United States monopoly bourgeoisie on the one hand and the peoples, and even the bourgeoisie of the other capitalist countries on the other. The working people of the capitalist countries live in such conditions that, increasingly, they realize that the only way out of their grave situation lies through socialism. Thus, increasingly favorable conditions are being created for bringing them into the active struggle for socialism. The aggressive imperialist circles of the United States, 
by pursuing the so-called positions of strength policy, seek to bring most countries of the world under their sway and to hamper the onward march of mankind in accordance with the laws of social development. On the pretext of combating communism, they are angling to bring more and more countries under their dominion, instigating the destruction of democratic freedoms, threatening the national independence of the developed capitalist countries, trying to enmesh the liberated peoples in new forms of colonialism, and systematically conducting subversive activities against the socialist countries. The policy of certain aggressive groups in the United States is aimed at rallying around them all the reactionary forces of the capitalist world. Acting in this way, they are becoming the center of world reaction, the sworn enemies of the people. By this policy, these anti-popular, aggressive imperialist forces are courting their own ruin, creating their own grave diggers. So long as imperialism exists, there will always be soil for aggressive wars. Throughout the post-war years, the American, British, French, and other imperialists and their hirelings have conducted and are conducting wars in Indochina, Indonesia, Korea, Malaya, Kenya, Guatemala, Egypt, Algeria, Oman, and Yemen. At the same time, the aggressive imperialist forces flatly refuse to cut armaments, to prohibit the use and production of atomic and hydrogen weapons, To agree on immediate discontinuation of the tests of these weapons, they are continuing the Cold War and arms drive, building more military bases, and conducting the aggressive policy of undermining peace and creating the danger of a new war. Were a world war to break out before agreement on prohibition of nuclear weapons is reached, it would inevitably become a nuclear war, unprecedented and destructive force. In West Germany, militarism is being revived with the United States' help, giving rise to a hotbed of war in the heart of Europe. The struggle against West German militarism and revanchism, which are now threatening peace, is a vital task facing the peace-loving forces of the German people and all the nations of Europe. An especially big role in this struggle belongs to the German Democratic Republic, the first worker-peasant state in German history, with which the participants in the meeting express their solidarity, and which they fully support. Simultaneously, the imperialists are trying to impose on the freedom-loving peoples of the Middle East the notorious eisenhower Dulles Doctrine, thereby creating the danger of war in this area. They are plotting conspiracies and provocations against independent Syria. The provocations against Syria and Egypt and other Arab countries pursue the aim of dividing and isolating the Arab countries in order to abolish their freedom and independence. The Sido aggressive bloc is a source of war danger in East Asia. The question of war or peaceful coexistence is now the crucial question of world policy. All the nations must display the utmost vigilance in regard to the war danger created by imperialism. At present, the forces of peace have so grown that there is a real possibility of averting wars, as was demonstrated by the collapse of the imperialist designs in Egypt. The imperialist plans to use the counter-revolutionary forces for the overthrow of the people's democratic system in Hungary have failed as well. The cause of peace is upheld by the powerful forces of our era, the invincible camp of socialist countries headed by the Soviet Union. The peace-loving countries of Asia and Africa are taking an anti-imperialist stand and forming, together with the socialist countries, a broad peace zone. The international working class, and above all its vanguard, the communist parties, the liberation movement of the peoples of the colonies and semi-colonies, the mass peace movement of the peoples, the peoples of the European countries who have proclaimed neutrality, The peoples of Latin America and the masses in the imperialist countries are putting up increasing resistance to the plans for a new war. An alliance of these mighty forces could prevent war, but should the bellicose imperialist maniacs venture, regardless of anything, to unleash a war, imperialism will doom itself to destruction, for the peoples will not tolerate a system that brings them so much suffering and exacts so many sacrifices. The communist and workers' parties taking part in the meeting declare that the Leninist principle of peaceful coexistence of the two systems, which has been further developed and brought up to date in the decisions of the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party, is the sound basis of the foreign policy of the socialist countries and the dependable pillar of peace and friendship among the peoples. The idea of peaceful coexistence coincides with the five principles advanced jointly by the Chinese People's Republic and the Republic of India and with the program adopted by the Bandung Conference of African-Asian Countries peace and peaceful coexistence have now become the demands of the broad masses in all countries. The communist parties regard the struggle for peace as their foremost task. They will do all in their power to prevent war. Section 2. The meeting considers that in the present situation, the strengthening of the unity and fraternal cooperation of the socialist countries, the communist and workers' parties, and the solidarity of the international working class, national liberation, 
and democratic movements acquire special significance. In the bedrock of the relations between the countries of the world socialist system and all the communist and workers' parties lie the principles of Marxism-Leninism, the principles of proletarian internationalism, which have been tested by life. Today, the vital interests of the working people of all countries call for their support of the Soviet Union and all the socialist countries who, pursuing a policy of preserving peace throughout the world, are the mainstay of peace and social progress. The working class, the democratic forces, and the working people everywhere are interested in tirelessly strengthening fraternal contacts for the sake of the common cause, in safeguarding from enemy encroachments the historic political and social gains effected in the Soviet Union, the first and mightiest socialist power, in the Chinese People's Republic, and in all the socialist countries, in seeing these gains extended and consolidated. The socialist countries base their relations on principles of complete equality, respect for territorial integrity, state independence and sovereignty, and non-interference in one another's affairs. These are vital principles. However, they do not exhaust the essence of relations between them. Fraternal mutual aid is part and parcel of these relations. This aid is a striking expression of socialist internationalism. On a basis of complete equality, mutual benefit, and comradely mutual assistance, the socialist states have established between themselves extensive economic and cultural cooperation, which plays an important part in promoting the economic and political independence of each socialist country and the socialist commonwealth as a whole. The socialist states will continue to extend and improve economic and cultural cooperation among themselves. The socialist states also advocate all-round expansion of economic and cultural relations with all other countries, provided they desire it, on a basis of equality, mutual benefit, and non-interference in each other's internal affairs. The solidarity of the socialist countries is not directed against any other country. On the contrary, it serves the interests of all the peace-loving peoples, restrains the aggressive strivings of the bellicose imperialist circles, and supports and encourages the growing forces of peace. The socialist countries are against the division of the world into military blocs, but in view of the situation that has taken shape, with the Western powers refusing to accept the proposals of the socialist countries for mutual abolition of military blocs, the Warsaw Pact Organization, which is of a defensive nature, which serves the security of the peoples of Europe and which supports peace throughout the world, must be preserved and strengthened. The socialist countries are united in a single community by the fact that they are taking the common socialist road, by the common class essence of the social and economic system and state authority, by the requirements of mutual aid and support, identity of interests and aims in the struggle against imperialism, for the victory of socialism and communism, and by the ideology of Marxism-Leninism, which is common to all. The solidarity and close unity of the socialist countries constitute a reliable guarantee of the sovereignty and independence of each. Stronger fraternal relations and friendship between the socialist countries call for a Marxist-Leninist international policy on the part of the communist and workers' parties, for educating all the working people in the spirit of combining internationalism with patriotism, and for a determined effort to overcome the survivals of bourgeois nationalism and chauvinism. All issues pertaining to relations between the socialist countries can be fully settled through comradely discussion, with strict observance of the principles of socialist internationalism. Section 3. The victory of socialism in the USSR and progress in socialist construction in the people's democracies find deep sympathy among the working class and the working people of all countries. The ideas of socialism are winning additional millions of people. In these conditions, the imperialist bourgeoisie attaches increasing importance to the ideological molding of the masses. It misrepresents socialism and smears Marxism-Leninism, misleads and confuses the masses. It is a prime task to intensify Marxist-Leninist education of the masses, combat bourgeois ideology, expose the lies and slanderous fabrications of imperialist propaganda against socialism and the communist movement, and widely propagate, in simple and convincing fashion, the ideas of socialism, peace, and friendship among nations. The meeting confirmed the identity of views of the communist and workers' parties on the cardinal problems of the socialist revolution and socialist construction. The experience of the Soviet Union and the other socialist countries has fully borne out the correctness of the Marxist-Leninist proposition that the processes of the socialist revolution and the building of socialism are governed by a number of basic laws applicable in all countries embarking on a socialist course. These laws manifest themselves everywhere alongside a great variety of historic national peculiarities and traditions which must by all means be taken into account. These laws are guidance of the working masses by the working class, 
the core of which is the Marxist-Leninist party, in effecting a proletarian revolution in one form or another, and establishing one form or other of the dictatorship of the proletariat, the alliance of the working class and the bulk of the peasantry and other sections of the working people, the abolition of capitalist ownership and the establishment of public ownership of the basic means of production, gradual socialist reconstruction of agriculture, planned development of the national economy aimed at building socialism and communism, at raising the standard of living of the working people, the carrying out of the socialist revolution in the sphere of ideology and culture, and the creation of a numerous intelligentsia devoted to the working class, the working people, and the cause of socialism, the abolition of national oppression, and the establishment of equality and fraternal friendship between the peoples, defense of the achievements of socialism against attacks by external and internal enemies, solidarity of the working class of the country in question with the working class of other countries, that is, proletarian internationalism. Marxism-Leninism calls for a creative application of the general principles of the socialist revolution and socialist construction depending on the concrete conditions of each country, and rejects the mechanical imitation of the policies and tactics of the communist parties of other countries, comment that is sometimes called formalism. Continuing, Lenin repeatedly called attention to the necessity of correctly applying the basic principles of communism, in keeping with the specific features of the nation, of the national state concerned. Disregard of national peculiarities by the proletarian party inevitably leads to its divorce from reality, from the masses, and is bound to prejudice the cause of socialism, and conversely, exaggeration of the role of these peculiarities or departure under the pretext of national peculiarities from the universal Marxist-Leninist truth on the socialist revolution and socialist construction is just as harmful to the socialist cause. I'm going to read that again. Disregard of national peculiarities by the proletarian party inevitably leads to its divorce from reality, from the masses, and is bound to prejudice the cause of socialism, and conversely, exaggeration, so that is, either ignoring it or underplaying it, or exaggerating it, overplaying it, those are both bad, of the role of these national peculiarities, or departure, under the pretext of national peculiarities, from the universal Marxist-Leninist truth on the socialist revolution and socialist construction, is just as harmful to the socialist cause. Continuing, the participants in the meeting consider that both these tendencies should be combated simultaneously. The communist and workers' parties of the socialist countries should firmly adhere to the principle of combining the above universal Marxist-Leninist truth with the specific revolutionary practice in their countries, creatively apply the general laws governing the socialist revolution and socialist construction in accordance with the concrete conditions of their countries, learn from each other, and share experience. Creative application of the general laws of socialist construction, tried and tested by experience, and the variety of forms and methods of building socialism used in different countries, represent a collective contribution to Marxist-Leninist theory. The theory of Marxism-Leninism derives from dialectical materialism. This world outlook reflects the universal law of development of nature, society, and human thinking. It is valid for the past, the present, and the future. Dialectical materialism is countered by metaphysics and idealism. Should the Marxist political party, in its examination of questions, base itself not on dialectics and materialism, the result will be one-sidedness and subjectivism, stagnation of thought, isolation from life, and loss of ability to make the necessary analysis of things and phenomena, revisionist and dogmatist mistakes, and mistakes in policy, application of dialectical materialism in practical work, and the education of the party functionaries and the broad masses in the spirit of Marxism-Leninism are urgent tasks of the communist and workers' parties. Of vital importance in the present stage is intensified struggle against opportunist trends in the working class and the communist movement. The meeting underlines the necessity of resolutely overcoming revisionism and dogmatism in the ranks of the communist and workers' parties. Revisionism and dogmatism in the working class and communist movement are today, as they have been in the past, international phenomena. Dogmatism and sectarianism hinder the development of Marxist-Leninist theory and its creative application in the changing conditions. They replace the study of the concrete situation with merely quoting classics and sticking to books, and they lead to the isolation of the party from the masses. A party that is withdrawn into the shell of sectarianism and that has lost contact with the masses cannot bring victory to the cause of the working class. In condemning dogmatism, the communist parties believe that the main danger at present is revisionism, or, in other words, right-wing opportunism, which, as a manifestation of bourgeois ideology, paralyzes the revolutionary energy of the working class and demands the preservation or restoration of capitalism. 
comment. So what does this look like in practice? Well, it's working class people taking up bourgeois ideas, becoming petty bourgeois, not necessarily in their actual class standing or relation to the mode of production, but petty bourgeois in the sense of imitating the bourgeoisie, but not being the bourgeoisie, in this case, in their values and ideas. Think in the United States, the sort of cable news addict, whether it's CNN, whether it's Fox News, whatever, people just drinking up bourgeois propaganda 24-7, buying into mainstream Democrat-Republican politics, or even the, quote, alternative Mad Max anarcho-capitalism of the Libertarian Party. Really, at this point, anyone buying into a political ideology that still centers capitalism as some kind of necessity for which there is no practical alternative. Continuing. However, dogmatism and sectarianism can also be the main danger at different phases of development in one party or another. It is for each communist party to decide what danger threatens it more at a given time. It should be pointed out that the conquest of power by the proletariat is only the beginning of the revolution, not its conclusion. After the conquest of power, the working class is faced with the serious tasks of effecting the socialist reconstruction of the national economy and laying the economic and technical foundation of socialism. At the same time, the overthrown bourgeoisie always endeavors to make a comeback. The influence exerted on society by the bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie, and their intelligentsia is still great. That is why a fairly long time is needed to resolve the issue of who will win, capitalism or socialism. The existence of bourgeois influence is an internal source of revisionism, while surrender to imperialist pressure is its external source. Modern revisionism seeks to smear the great teachings of Marxism-Leninism, declare that it is outmoded, and alleges that it has lost its significance for social progress. The revisionists try to exercise the revolutionary spirit of Marxism, to undermine faith in socialism among the working class and the working people in general. They deny the historical necessity for a proletarian revolution and the dictatorship of the proletariat during the period of transition from capitalism to socialism. They deny the leading role of the Marxist-Leninist party, reject the principles of proletarian internationalism, and call for rejection of the Leninist principles of party organization, and above all, of democratic centralism, for transforming the Communist Party from a militant revolutionary organization into some kind of debating society. The experience of the international communist movement shows that resolute defense by the communist and workers' parties, the Marxist-Leninist unity of their ranks, and the banning of factions and groups sapping unity guarantee the successful solution of the tasks of the socialist revolution, the establishment of socialism and communism. Section 4. The Communist and Workers' Parties are faced with great historic tasks. The carrying out of these tasks necessitates closer unity, not only of the Communist and Workers' Parties, but of the entire working class, necessitates cementing the alliance of the working class and peasantry, rallying the working people and progressive mankind, the freedom and peace-loving forces of the world. The defense of peace is the most important worldwide task of the day. The Communist and Workers' Parties in all countries stand for joint action on the broadest possible scale, with all forces favoring peace and opposed to war. The participants in the meeting declare that they support the efforts of all states, parties, organizations, movements, and individuals who champion peace and oppose war, who want peaceful coexistence, collective security in Europe and Asia, reduction of armaments, and prohibition of the use and tests of nuclear weapons. The Communist and Workers' Parties are loyal defenders of the national and democratic interests of the people of all countries. The working class and the peoples of many countries are still confronted with the historic tasks of struggle for national independence against colonial aggression and feudal oppression. What is needed here is a united anti-imperialist and anti-feudal front of the workers, peasants, urban petty bourgeoisie, national bourgeoisie, and other patriotic democratic forces. Numerous facts show that the greater and stronger the unity of the various patriotic and democratic forces, the greater the guarantee of victory in the common struggle. At present, the struggle of the working class and the masses of the people against the war danger and for their vital interests is spearheaded against the big monopoly group of capital, as those chiefly responsible for the arms race, as those who organize or inspire plans for preparing a new world war, and who are the bulwark of aggression and reaction. The interests and the policy of this handful of monopolies conflict increasingly not only with the interests of the working class, but the other sections of capitalist society, the peasants, intellectuals, and petty and middle urban bourgeoisie. 
In those capitalist countries where the American monopolies are out to establish their hegemony, and in the countries already suffering from the U.S. policy of economic and military expansion, the objective conditions are being created for uniting, under the leadership of the working class and its revolutionary parties, broad sections of the population to fight for peace, the defense of national independence and democratic freedoms, to raise the standard of living, to carry through radical land reforms, and to overthrow the rule of the monopolies who betray the national interests. The profound historic changes and decisive switch in the balance of forces in the international sphere in favor of socialism, and the tremendous growth of the power of attraction exerted by socialist ideas among the working class, working peasantry, and working intelligentsia create more favorable conditions for the victory of socialism. The forms of the transition of socialism may vary for different countries. The working class and its vanguard, the Marxist-Leninist party, seek to achieve the socialist revolution by peaceful means. This would accord with the interests of the working class and the people as a whole, as well as with the national interests of the country. Today, in a number of capitalist countries, the working class headed by its vanguard has the opportunity, given a united working class and popular front or other workable forms of agreement and political cooperation between the different parties and public organizations, to unite a majority of the people, to win state power without civil war, and ensure the transfer of the basic means of production to the hands of the people. It has this opportunity while relying on the majority of the people and decisively rebuffing the opportunist elements incapable of relinquishing the policy of compromise with the capitalists and landlords. The working class then can defeat the reactionary, anti-popular forces, secure a firm majority in parliament, transform parliament from an instrument serving the class interests of the bourgeoisie into an instrument serving the working people, so no wonder some people had issues with this. Launch a non-parliamentary mass struggle, smash the resistance of the reactionary forces, and create the necessary conditions for peaceful realization of the socialist revolution. All this will be possible only by broad and ceaseless development of the class struggle of the workers, peasant masses, and the urban middle strata against big monopoly capital, against reaction, for profound social reforms, for peace and socialism. In the event of the ruling classes resorting to violence against the people, the possibility of non-peaceful transition to socialism should be borne in mind. Leninism teaches, and experience confirms, that the ruling classes never relinquish power voluntarily. In this case, the degree of bitterness and the forms of the class struggle will depend not so much on the proletariat as on the resistance put up by the reactionary circles to the will of the overwhelming majority of the people on these circles using force at one or another stage of the struggle for socialism. The possibility of one or another way to socialism depends on the concrete conditions in each country. In the struggle for better conditions of the working people, for preservation and extension of democratic rights, winning and maintaining national independence and peace among nations, and also in the struggle for winning power and building socialism, the communist parties seek cooperation with the socialist parties. Although the right-wing socialist party leaders are doing their best to hamper this cooperation, comment almost like they're not really interested in it, there are increasing opportunities for cooperation between the communists and socialists on many issues. The ideological differences between the communist and the socialist parties should not keep them from establishing unity of action on the many pressing issues that confront the working class movement. In the socialist countries where the working class is in power, the communist and workers' parties, which have the opportunity to establish close relations with the broad masses of the people, should constantly rely on them and make the building and defense of socialism the cause of millions who fully realize that they are the masters of their country, of great importance for enhancing the activity and creative initiative of the broad masses and their solidarity, for consolidating the socialist system and stepping up socialist construction are the measures taken in recent years by the socialist countries to expand socialist democracy and encourage criticism and self-criticism. To bring about real solidarity of the working class, of all working people, and the whole of progressive mankind, of the freedom-loving and peace-loving forces of the world, it is necessary above all to promote the unity of the communist and workers' parties, to foster solidarity between the communist and workers' parties of all countries. This solidarity is the core of still greater solidarity. It is the main guarantee of the victory of the cause of the working class. The communist and workers' parties have a particularly important responsibility with regard to the destinies of the world socialist system and the international communist movement. The communist and workers' parties represented at the meeting declare that they will tirelessly promote their unity and comradely cooperation with a view to further consolidating the commonwealth of socialist states and in the interests of the international working class movement, a 
peace, and socialism. The meeting notes with satisfaction that the international communist movement has grown, withstood numerous serious trials, and won a number of major victories. By their deeds, the communists have demonstrated to the working people on a worldwide scale the vitality of the Marxist-Leninist theory and their ability not only to propagate the great ideals of socialism, but also to realize them in exceedingly strenuous conditions. Like any progressive movement in human society, the communist movement is bound to encounter difficulties and obstacles. However, as in the past, no difficulties or obstacles can change now, nor will they be able to change in the future the objective laws governing historical progress or affect the determination of the working class to transform the old world and create a new one. Ever since they began their struggle, the communists have been baited and persecuted by the reactionary forces, but the communist movement heroically repels all attacks, emerging from these trials stronger and more steeled. The communists, by further consolidating their unity, counter attempts by the reactionary imperialist forces to prevent human society from marching toward a new era. Contrary to the absurd assertions of imperialism about a so-called crisis of communism, the communist movement is growing and gathering strength. The historic decisions of the 20th Congress of the CPSU are of tremendous importance, not only to the CPSU and to the building of communism in the USSR. They have opened a new stage in the world communist movement and pushed ahead its further development along Marxist-Leninist lines. The results of the Congresses of the Communist Parties of China, France, Italy, and other countries in recent times have clearly demonstrated the unity and solidarity of the party ranks and their loyalty to the principles of proletarian internationalism. This meeting of the representatives of communist and workers' parties testifies to the international solidarity of the communist movement. After exchanging views, the participants in the meeting arrived at the conclusion that in present conditions, it is expedient, besides bilateral meetings of leading personnel and exchange of information, to hold, as the need arises, more representative conferences of communist and workers' parties to discuss current problems, share experience, study each other's views and attitudes, and coordinate action in the joint struggle for the common goals of peace, democracy, and socialism. The participants in the meeting unanimously expressed their firm confidence that by closing their ranks and thereby rallying the working class and the peoples of all countries, the communist and workers' parties will surmount all obstacles in their onward movement and accelerate further big victories for the cause of peace, democracy, and socialism. And that is the end of the 1957 Moscow Declaration. What do you think? Leave a question or comment below. For now, I will add this. I think that the best case for understanding that stuff about the parliamentary road, which at that point in history and actually since had never worked, nor probably will it ever really work, at least in conditions like the ones that we face now, where capitalism is still the dominant system and there is basically capitalist encirclement, I think that the best case is, you know, if it wasn't an attempt at being revisionist, it at least greatly overestimated the position of the international communist movement and the socialist camp at that time. Yes, it's incredible that 40 years after the October Revolution, there was such tremendous growth and the socialist revolution had spread to other countries. Phenomenal. But I think that there's a line you have to draw between putting out inspiring propaganda and you know, things intended to uplift and move more people to the rising cause of socialism and all that, and then actually winding up overestimating and being unscientific about your observations and how great are the changes in the conditions where do these actually allow for changes in strategy and tactics? I would say at that time, definitely that was not the case, yet they were kind of saying it anyway. Maybe that was a line for when, you know, two-thirds of the world was already socialist and the capitalists were just sort of surrendering. Of course, by this point, some of the issue of capitalist encirclement of the USSR had been beaten back, but it wasn't really with socialist encirclement so much as kind of a buffer zone. In other words, I think that arguably the less developed economies of Eastern Europe, which were brought under the new people's democracy type of system, Kind of a separate discussion in itself, but again, this is more of a buffer zone rather than, I think, a real fundamental change in conditions. What kind of change in conditions would have been fundamental in my estimation? Well, let's say that not just half of Germany had gone socialist, but the whole thing. And let's say also Italy and Spain. And let's also say some of the Scandinavian countries and Japan. Okay. So that would be more of a fundamental change in circumstances where 
At that point, you would have the US, the UK and the British Commonwealth, and France, maybe also Holland and Belgium, that would still be capitalist. Actually, let's also throw Holland into the equation. So Belgium stays with France and stays capitalist. Holland, though, uh, inspired by their German neighbors, goes socialist as well. Well, at that point, you have major erosion of the, quote, great powers, what today would be like the G7, and their close allies. So basically, then you're going forward from the late 1940s with, you know, half of the imperialist camp gone over to socialism. These are major economies, major political and economic ties there, pretty much balancing out the power of, say, you know, France, Belgium, the UK, the US, Canada, Australia. Actually, you know, I think closer to more of like a 50-50 point of this is the point where socialism could actually start overtaking capitalism. But instead, the revolutions kept happening more on the periphery. And it's great that they did. The problem is that it left that imperialist core more or less intact and able to reform alliances and then launch more aggression against the world later, even actually wiping out a lot of socialist gains in the second half of the 20th century. But since the beginning of Marxism, people up to and including Marx in terms of sincere and committed Marxists have held out the possibility in the sense of, well, I guess anything's possible that the bourgeoisie could peacefully give up. Marx even thought at one point, and I think that this kind of speaks to Marx's lack of familiarity with the United States more than anything else, that the United States might be a situation where a peaceful transition was possible. But this was kind of just a guess and a passing mention. What was always held as far more likely would be a violent struggle by the bourgeoisie against the organized class that they were repressing or attempting to repress and exploit the proletariat. And depending on the stage of proletarianization of a particular country, proletarianization being the process by which capitalism turns all non-bourgeois classes into the proletariat, any other working classes such as the peasantry, which is really like a rural petty bourgeoisie, working in alliance with the proletariat. And of course, the alliance between the proletariat and the peasantry is not an automatic thing. It's something that needs to be fostered by communists while trying to maintain the proletarians in the leading position within that alliance. So yeah, that's what Marxists have always acknowledged as the most likely thing and just a reality that needs to be faced is that the bourgeoisie is going to be violent when you attempt to take capitalism away from them. But again, in the anything's possible thing, there may be conditions under which that struggle can't happen, that the bourgeoisie don't have the nerve to be violent. But at what point does that happen? Well, we haven't reached that point in history. So whatever point of the balance of power between organized capitalist and socialist powers in the world is, it's more advanced than what we saw at the peak of the 20th century. And it certainly was not the case in 1957 when this statement was made. So people who criticized that were right to do so as at a minimum jumping the gun, if not deliberately trying to sell people on a more reformist vision of what the future would bring in terms of trying to do proletarian revolution. All right, I'm going to leave it there for now. Again, what do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion there as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening and thanks to the current patrons and buymeacoffee.com supporters whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all or buymeacoffee.com slash socialism for all socialism for all is non-commercial and viewer supported we don't run ads or sponsorships so that support is critical for me to be able to spend as much time as i do on this channel creating the content doing the streams and promoting it helping more people to stumble across this content more easily as capitalism goes into deeper and deeper crisis thanks again and we will see you in the next video <laughs>